Take my girlfriend. Uh huh. Please don't, please don't let him kill me, man. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Please Nobody's don't. gonna hurt you, dude. Welcome to U.S. Corrupt cops. Join us as we uncover the truth behind police misconduct. In our latest video, we expose two cases where innocent lives were lost due to corrupt officers. Take action now. Subscribe, like, and share to demand accountability and justice. If you like this video, press 1. On May 26, 2019, a man named John Kelly, who is deaf, was walking along a highway frontage road after a minor disagreement with his wife. A bystander observed Mr. Kelly and his wife, who is also deaf, communicating through sign language. Upon witnessing this, the bystander promptly called 911 and reported a potential physical altercation. In response, the San Marcos Police Department dispatched three officers to the location where Mr. Kelly was last seen. The ensuing events were nothing short of outrageous. In the footage, it's evident that all three officers took just under 10 seconds to draw their tasers on Mr. Kelly. Subsequently, two of them simultaneously deployed their weapons. Initially, it seemed the officers were yelling at Mr. Kelly to halt as he continued walking, minding his own business. However, when they perceived his non-compliance, they abandoned any de-escalation techniques and resorted straight to the use of force. What exacerbates this situation is the third officer, who refrained from deploying his taser, but was observed kicking Mr. Kelly twice. As if this weren't egregious enough, when Mr. Kelly attempted to roll over to communicate his deafness, he was drive-stunned directly on his back. Furthermore, despite realizing Mr. Kelly's deafness, the officers persisted in giving him verbal commands. It's difficult to ascertain the exact number of times Mr. Kelly was tased, but what's undeniable is the unwarranted use of force by all three officers. More on this shortly. One crucial detail is Mr. Kelly's report of temporary blackouts while being tased, underscoring the officer's ruthless behavior towards a clearly deaf individual. Oh, 
In simpler terms, the police finally did what they should have done earlier by communicating with Mr. Kelly using a notepad and his phone. Mr. Kelly was clearly angry and confused after being tased for no apparent reason. One officer shouted at him despite knowing he was deaf, which goes against the values of the San Marcos Police Department. Another officer tried to justify using force by saying Mr. Kelly saw them coming, but even if that were true, it wouldn't justify using a taser on him since he wasn't threatening anyone, he was just walking down the road. Overall, the officers didn't act according to the department's values and mishandled the situation.
Mr. Kelly was wondering why the police used a taser on him multiple times while he was just walking down the street. Tasers are meant to control violent individuals with minimal risk of injury. They can be used when someone is being violent or resisting arrest, but not simply for fleeing from the police. Since Mr. Kelly wasn't showing any signs of violence or resistance, the officer's decision to use the taser appears to be an abuse of power and a violation of protocol. At this juncture, EMS arrived on the scene and assessed Mr. Kelly, given his taser exposure and the possibility of remaining probes on his body. Anyway, it's crucial to note that the officer's actions constitute an excessive use of force according to the law, and this is a significant issue. Firstly, consider that the taser qualifies as a use of force akin to physical tackling, striking, or restraining a subject by an officer. Secondly, any force employed must not only be reasonable, but also commensurate with the circumstances 
and proportional to any perceived threat, including the risk of death or physical harm. It's worth noting that in Mr. Kelly's situation, there was absolutely no discernible threat. Excessive force occurs when a police officer utilizes more force than reasonably necessary. The Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, along with police department policies, safeguards citizens against excessive force by law enforcement. After that, all the officers at the scene turned off their body cameras and had a lengthy discussion, the details of which were not disclosed. Regardless, Mr. Kelly was released without any charges. However, he later revealed that he had to be hospitalized for a few injuries sustained during the incident. He expressed his disdain for the actions of the police department, stating it was unjust. Moreover, the whole ordeal unfolded in front of his wife and several of their children, adding to the distress. To exacerbate matters, officers Andrew Wisner, Basil Pierce, and John Doherty claimed in their incident reports that Mr. Kelly had concealed his hands under his torso, attempting to shift blame onto him. However, footage contradicts their narrative, clearly showing Mr. Kelly with his hands raised by his head both times he was on his stomach. A federal lawsuit filed in May 2021 accuses the city of San Mar Marcos and the three officers of violating Mr. Kelly's civil rights and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Two years later, in early 2023, Rebecca Weber, an attorney for Mr. Kelly, stated that a judge is currently deliberating whether the lawsuit will proceed to a jury trial. She anticipates a decision by July or August. However, as of the date of this recording, there have been no updates. Nonetheless, San Maros Police Chief Stan Stanrich mentioned that all three officers underwent training on interacting with drivers who are deaf or hard of hearing. He also noted that the department reviewed the incident when it occurred and found that the use of force was within policy. In April 2020, the police got a 911 call reporting an unidentified man had entered their house. Shortly after, when the Glasgow Police Department showed up, they found Jeremy Marr seated in a lawn chair outside the house. Come here. I'm not going to hurt you. Come here. All right, come here. No one's going to hurt you. Come here. Nothing. All right, put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. I have nothing on me. Please right. don't hurt me, man. You got any weapons on you? No, sir. I got a knife in my pocket. It's nothing. It's got. Right. It's got a. Right. Don't pull it out. Please don't hurt me. Please don't do it. Nobody's don't gonna hurt you. What's your name? Me. My name's Jeremy Moore. All right. The homeowner later stated that Jeremy showed up in a visibly agitated and paranoid state. She said she dialed 911 upon finding Jeremy inside her house without permission. Despite his odd behavior, Jeremy obeyed the officer's orders, raising his hands as he approached. He pleaded not to be harmed while disclosing the knife in his pocket. The officer continued to reassure him that no harm would come to him. Be What's going on? Put your, don't put your hands in your pocket. I'm sorry. I, I ain't doing nothing wrong. I ain't doing nothing like that. People try uh, out to get me. I'm not high. I'm none of those things. Fucking, I left my house and stuff. I'm talking to my girlfriend's. Uh -huh. please, don't, please don't let him kill me, man. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Please Nobody's don't. gonna hurt you, dude. You see anybody hurting you? You should be the house right next to the old Please, please don't. Uh, I know that they're gonna fucking do something bad to me, man. All right. I really do got people. Are you on medication? Right. No. Who's, who's hurting you? Fucking, I got some people after me and stuff, man. I'm not, I'm not hallucinating. I'm not none of those things. Just don't let nobody do nothing to me, man. Please. Oh, just go ahead and sit right there on my bumper. P please don't do this, me on the bumper. I really don't want more people you. can see me, man. Please. No way's gonna hurt you. Go ahead and sit on my bumper. Please don't make me sit on your bumper, please. Why not? Because, man, I'm telling you, motherfuckers are following me. I'm not high. I'm not. You got, you got two officers right here. No one's gonna hurt you. I want I got, you to stand over here. I don't over trust here. anybody, man. Okay. Well, not, please, sir, don't do this to no, me. I don't want to be hurt. Okay. Just. 
Still right here. You said you had a knife on you? Yes, sir. While displaying symptoms of a mental health crisis, the officer seizes Jeremy's jacket to relocate him in front of his patrol car. Sergeant Morell arrives at the scene and seizes his wrists, pressing them onto the hood of the patrol car, exacerbating Jeremy's distress. Despite complying as they search him, he persistently reiterates his fears and paranoid delusions. He's got a hold of my jacket. Which? He's got a hold of my jacket, man. Please, hey, don't do nothing to me. Please, please, please. Calm don't down. Do to me, all. Please don't do nothing to me, all. I don't deserve this, man. I, I don't deserve this, man. I don't deserve this, man. I don't deserve this, man. Yes, sir, please don't do nothing to me. Like this. 30, 30, I'll can't swell. Hey, please don't do nothing to me. I don't deserve this, man. I, I don't, I don't deserve this. Please don't do it. Please don't. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. Please don't let him kill me, man. I, I please don't don't do this to me, please. Oh, man, you're you just you're too squirrely here, man. You're freaking us all a bit. Guys, yeah, I tell you, man. I've had people take me. Please don't do this to me, guys. Don't do this to me, please. I don't deserve it. We're going away. Yeah, come here. I don't deserve it. Please, y'all. Yeah, no, please, man. Don't kill me, y'all. Don't kill me. I please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. Please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt. Within 43 seconds of bringing him to the ground, and despite three officers being present to handcuff him. Officer Turcott, after repeatedly assuring Jeremy that nobody would get hurt, shouts, Taser, Taser, as he proceeds to tase him almost a dozen times in the following moments. The body camera footage does not clearly show the actions of the officer. <laughs> However, according to Kentucky State Police records, Sergeant Morell administered one knee strike to the hip region while Officer Phillips delivered a minimum of five knee strikes to the hip and upper leg areas. During the struggle, Officer Turcott startles his colleague, causing the officer to laugh and quickly dismount Mar to prevent any more friendly fire incidents. <laughs> you guys the shit out of me. Did you zap you one time? Yeah, you got me good. At this juncture, Jeremy seems feeble, his actions are slow, and he finds it difficult to articulate words. Hands on your back, you're gonna get zapped again! Okay! Move them now! Okay! Do it! Okay! I hear okay, but you're not moving! There's some shackles in the back of my car, can you get those? There's some shackles in the back of my car. They're Jeremy was then taken to the hospital where he was declared dead. A witness to the incident informed the Kentucky State Police that when Jeremy was flipped over, he seemed lifeless and wasn't breathing. The medical examiner determined that his cause of death was agitated excited delirium and intoxication. They observed that although Jeremy had taser prongs embedded in his back, there was no evidence of fatal injuries. Predictably, the police conducted an internal investigation and cleared the officers of any wrongdoing. However, not everyone accepts this outcome especially after another eyewitness video emerged. His death a video surfaced. We don't know what took place before this, but this video here appears to show Glasgow police trying to place Marr under arrest. Jeremy's family lodged a lawsuit against the Glasgow Police Department and its officers, contending that Jeremy's death resulted not from his intoxication, but from fatal injuries inflicted by the arresting officers. But if you watch the video, you clearly see it was overkill to me. I mean, I wouldn't be able to take it. The situation involves Jeremy's death after an encounter with officers from the Glasgow Police Department, GPD. A lawsuit was filed alleging violation of Jeremy's constitutional rights and insufficient training of officers in non-lethal force. City Attorney Matt Hancock defended the officers' actions, but the case proceeded against them individually after the judge dismissed the case against the GPD. Federal Judge Greg Stivers ruled that the officers' alleged actions, including repeated tasering of Jeremy, despite him posing no threat, could constitute excessive force and a violation of constitutional rights. This incident is part of a larger pattern as previous cases have involved deaths following aggressive tasing by police officers, such as the 2007 incident at Vancouver International Airport. He's crossed the threshold. One officer can be heard saying, may I use tasers? And another officer says, yes. He speaks Russian and that's it. No English. He died soon after. But the RCMP is asking people to hold off their criticism, at least until the investigation is complete. In contrast, Jeremy was tased more than twice as much. It's reasonable to speculate that Jeremy could have died from the electric shock, 
One could argue that the police could have handled this differently. Jeremy never initiated violence against the officers or anyone else. This was clearly a mental health issue from the start. However, the officers appeared completely unprepared to employ effective de-escalation tactics or even consider calling in a mental health evaluation team. Instead, they resorted to violence with fatal consequences. Despite years passing since the incident and the filing of the lawsuit, it seems it may be many more before this case is resolved. On September 4th, 2022, two officers from the Michigan State Police were on patrol duty when they observed a man walking along the road instead of using the sidewalk. Instead of issuing a verbal warning and directing him to use the sidewalk, both officers approached the man, exited their patrol vehicle, and immediately initiated physical contact with him. The male subject, 28-year-old Michael D. Wilson, appeared startled and bewildered when the officers swiftly initiated physical action without prior notice. They immediately seized his arms and forcibly moved him toward the patrol vehicle. At this moment, Mr. Wilson vehemently expressed to the officers that he was innocent and had committed no wrongdoing. Mr. Wilson astutely inquired about the status of their activated body cameras, hinting that he was already aware of potential misconduct by these law enforcement officers. As Mr. Wilson persisted in demanding information from the officers regarding the situation, he was abruptly instructed to comply by placing his hands behind his back for the application of handcuffs. In Michigan, cops are supposed to have a good reason to stop and question someone, search them or their stuff, get a warrant or make an arrest. Reasonable suspicion means the cops need to reasonably believe a crime has happened or is about to. Probable cause means they need substantial evidence that a crime has been, is being, or will be committed. In this situation, it looks like the officers, especially Trooper Paul Arrowwood, wrongly stopped Mr. Wilson. They used force by slamming him to the ground and trying to restrain him, even though he seemed willing to cooperate. This raises concerns that the officers might have broken the law by not following the proper rules for detention and use of force. However, despite Mr. Wilson's verbal agreement to comply with the officers, Trooper Arrowwood opted to punch Mr. Wilson in the face multiple times. The body camera footage proves that Mr. Wilson was not resisting but rather attempting to roll over on his own without the unnecessary physical force from the officer. At that moment, Trooper Airwood initiated physical aggression against Mr. Wilson without any legitimate justification. Despite Mr. Wilson's plea for help out of fear, Trooper Airwood persistently struck him in the face multiple times. While the second officer at the scene threatened to use a taser on Mr. Wilson, Trooper Airwood relentlessly continued his assault, repeatedly punching Mr. Wilson in the face, despite Mr. Wilson exhibiting no signs of resistance. The situation escalated when Trooper Arrowwood delivered a series of forceful knee strikes to Mr. Wilson's face, exacerbating the already tense circumstances. Shockingly, this violent incident unfolded in plain view of the second officer, who chose to stand idle, merely observing the unfolding chaos. Shortly thereafter, additional officers arrived at the scene to provide backup. At one stage, a total of six officers were observed physically subduing Mr. Wilson. This raised the critical query of whether such a considerable number of grown men were truly essential to restrain a sole individual who had just undergone severe injuries due to Trooper Arrowwood. The scuffle eventually concluded when the officers handcuffed Mr. Wilson. Nevertheless, the footage revealed another distressing incident as one of the officers hoisted Mr. Wilson up from the ground and forcefully hurled him back down once more. 
The use of excessive force and abuse of power didn't stop there. Following the initial incident, Trooper Arrowwood can be observed gripping Mr. Wilson's collar, forcefully shoving him toward the patrol vehicle. Adding to the distressing scene, Trooper Arrowwood proceeded to grasp Mr. Wilson by the neck, maintaining his hold while conducting a search for weapons or illicit substances. Even in the midst of this appalling situation, Mr. Wilson informed Trooper Arrowwood of his intention to file a lawsuit. With a smirk, Trooper Arrowwood retorted, Go ahead, sue me then. After a thorough search, despite physically restraining Mr. Wilson, the officers found no illegal items. They proceeded to place him inside the patrol vehicle, despite his complete innocence. Mr. Wilson, who had endured multiple blows to his face by Trooper Arrowwood, was unsurprisingly bleeding. He urgently requested an ambulance to assess his injuries and provide necessary treatment. Minutes later, EMS arrived, and upon examination, Mr. Wilson, in severe pain and unjustly assaulted, expressed his dismay at the unwarranted aggression. Ironically, the paramedics skillfully de-escalated the situation, a responsibility that should have been carried out by the trained officers from the beginning. In this situation, a guy named Mr. Wilson, who didn't do anything wrong, got physically attacked by Trooper Arrowwood instead of getting the right treatment. Mr. Wilson got hit with charges of assault and resisting arrest initially even though the body camera footage showed he didn't resist as much as Trooper Arrowwood claimed. Prosecutors eventually decided not to charge Mr. Wilson, and he was let out of jail after spending two nights there. Trooper Arrowwood, whose report had misleading info, got suspended by the Michigan State Police, and a formal complaint led to a criminal investigation overseen by Lieutenant Michael Anderson. Even though Trooper Arrowwood was called in for an interview, he refused and talked to a union rep instead. Several months later, on March 2, 2023, Trooper Arrowwood was officially charged with misconduct in office and assault and battery. At his arraignment in Saginaw County District Court, Trooper Arrowwood faced charges that could mean prison time and fines. He's currently out on a $7,500 personal recognizance bond and is on unpaid suspension from the Michigan State Police until his case is resolved. Thank you for tuning in to our video highlighting two serious cases of police corruption. Let's join hands to spread the message and demand justice by subscribing, liking and sharing this video on our YouTube channel. U.S. Corrupt Cops, be a part of our voice and take action to ensure everyone is treated fairly. Thank you for contributing to the fight for justice and combating corruption within law enforcement.